Right, while we're, late, while we're waiting for the last few people to join, I will kick off because this looks like a very popular se session. It's lovely to see you all here. And I know we've had some great sessions um, with the likes of Chris Curtis and our soul and obviously Keir this morning. Um, before we start and I talk about uh, who we're hearing from today and what we're discussing, just want to run through a few points in the structure of the session. So we're going to be talking about Labour Party values. Um, we're keen for these sessions to be very discussion-based and for you to ask questions. So we'll be hearing from each of the speakers for about three minutes, after which point I'll share a short discussion based on my own thoughts and some prompts. And we'll also be taking questions from the audience. Um, please use the chat box to ask questions. I think you should be able to send a chat to my colleague, Kira, and she'll pass them on to me. Uh, the last thing before I introduce our speakers is just to remind you all that this session will be recorded. So bear in mind what you say here. We'll be living on the internet for however long uh, our YouTube channel continues to exist, if that matters to you. Um, and without further ado, let's start talking about Labour Party values. So as I'm sure I've so you've heard by now, the theme of today is rebuilding Labour and rebuilding the nation. Now as activists, supporters and politicians, I know on the doorstep, I speak a lot about our values and Labour values, but the truth is that they often mean quite different things to different people. And today I'm really privileged to be joined by three of Labour's intellectual leading lights to discuss this, uh, what our values are, forming a coalition around them, and most importantly, articulating these values to the public. So I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Pete Kyle, MP for Hove and the new schools minister. Congratulations. John Collis, MP for Dagenham and Raynham, and Stella Creasy, MP for Walthamstow. Now that's more than enough from me. Um, and I will let Pete kick us off. Thank you. I couldn't unmute myself. I just don't want Stella to, to think that I'm not very good at uh, technolo technology at all. But thanks for having me here. We've only got three minutes, so I'm just going to sort of just spew some things out, which will be quite disparate and a bit all over the place. But I hope that will just give us uh, some stuff to get our, our teeth into. I'm not a sociologist, so I, you know, I, find, I, I enter conversations about what words mean with real trepidation because anybody that's worked in the voluntary sector or has worked out in the, even the private sector knows that you can spend endless amounts of time fighting over definitions of you know, what your sector is and what to call your sector and suddenly you forget actually you're here to do something. Um, but I think that we can all agree that we have a set of priorities and that our priorities as a party are very different from other political parties. Uh, and I think that is you know, prioritizing opportunity uh, has become a very big thing and has always been there. Uh, I wish we could get back to the sort of old fashioned word of uh, self betterment uh, and really re engage rather than just actually doing education to people, but re engage people's you know, determination to actually you know, better themselves and do better by themselves and actually give people the tools to fulfill their own potential. Because I don't think I've ever met any institution anywhere which actually recognizes the potential and ambition that people have for their own selves. Uh, I know this very, very personally because of myself and you know, my dad in, in particular. You know, social versus physical, this is something that came out of the presentation that we had earlier. The Labour Party, we, fo we really focus on social progression. Sometimes we uh, don't focus so much on physical development. When you saw that presentation earlier on the polling, which I thought was completely fascinating, wasn't it interesting that Labour voters thought that we should be focusing much, much more on, on public services, but Tory voters uh, wanted to a huge degree to be focusing on town centres and the physical regeneration of their communities. You know, those are the sorts of things I think we need to, to, to recognise in, in the new world. Clearly collectivism and public services is, is a central theme to the Labour Party. And I think these are things that we can agree on. You know, we've been invited to talk about some of the challenges that we have with fa factionalism within the party. Uh, this is something that's been hugely frustrating to me and actually probably all of us uh, who are presenting from the, uh, from the PLP today, uh, because I think we're all people that actually reach out beyond different factions and enjoy meeting people who have a different worldview within, within the party. Um, but I think, I, I like to sort of think that 
uh, our relationship with the Tories is something that we don't talk about very much as a party and actually does differentiate different wings of the party. Uh, you know, I, I don't say this in any way to be provocative or uh, so forth, but uh, I was quite shocked when uh, Laura Pidcock made that statement about never willing to be friends with a Tory, simply because, you know, I think it was incredibly alienating for people who have voted Tories in the past because they see themselves as people having a very diverse social network. Most, most people outside of politics have been incredibly socially, economically, uh, in many different ways, um, uh, diverse social background. And when they look at the Labour Party and see that we're being very pure in our social choices, then I think that's something that really alienates us. Um, you know, and, and for me in Hove, uh, I couldn't have won without the Tories voting for me here in 2015 for the very first time in their lives, probably for their families uh, intergenerationally voting. So, you know, I, I owe a huge thank, a debt of gratitude to Tories locally who made that switch. And it's something that we need to get really comfortable with going forward. Because, you know, I've learned through experience here, defeating Tories, that talking to Tories doesn't make you a Tory, it helps you beat them. You know, and these are the sorts of things that we need to get really, you know, comfortable with going forward. And I've always been someone who, when you go down the streets and you see a, you know, in, a, in an area perhaps of deprivation, and you see a home with the English flag draped over it, you know, lots of uh, activists go, well, I'm not going to that one. Well, I go to it like with a, like a, you know, like a, you know, a homing beacon, because, you know, those are where the really interesting conversations are. And they're, those are where the opportunities lie to show a reasonable, listening, empathetic uh, response and face of the Labour Party. Uh, and then just I'll finish just by saying a word about Hartlepool, because I had a real surprise in Hartlepool, even though I've been to Hartlepool many times and I was up in the North East as before this by election as recently as last September. It's an area that I have a, a huge amount of um, you know, affection for and lots of friends who live there. And it's a place I really enjoy visiting. But the surprise for me on the doorsteps of Hartlepool in the run up to the election uh, in, and in the, in, the, in the period that we're living in, there is so much focus on difference, on, on uh, the anger that all of us were going up there expecting to enter battle of some kind. The surprise for me was just how similar the conversations I had on most doorsteps were with having conversations with most people on doorsteps in Hove. The similarities were really striking. There was only one thing I would say that I would say point to as a real fundamental difference and that's that lots of people in Hartlepool said that they wanted things very, very local. Uh, so, you know, I, to the point where I started to ask people when we we're having conversation, uh, did you grow up near here? And many of them could actually say the street nearby that they grew up on. And then I started asking people, you know, where do your parents live? And almost everyone I spoke to could point across the road or across the field or somewhere to where their parents were living. That is a difference with Hove. But actually, there is something that really, really connects us. And that is, people want to get on in life. And we in Labour Party have started to sort of forego conversations about the big fundamental human uh, desires that we have that unite all of us across races, across generations, across ge geography, the ability just to get on in life and deliver certain things better than we then was done by our parents or we've done 10 years ago and you know it could be on anything from education to a, to a nice holiday each year but it is actually just about moving forward in life but we in the Labour Party have increasingly categorized people and spoken to people's differences rather than speaking to the things that bring us together and the shared experiences we all have as Britons as a people from different towns uh, you know, just as people living in this country in the 2020s. So, you know, I don't want to be, you know, the LGBT uh, person. I want to be the person first and LGBT with it. And I think increasingly we are speaking to people's differences and to people's sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, labels than we are speaking to the whole people. Uh, and I think that is something which is, is obviously coming out of an era where difference and respect and equality is very, very important. But sometimes we're talking only 
to people's labels and not speaking to the whole person. And I think if we re-engage the whole person, that is a way back into uniting people from across regions, across races, across uh, uh, all sorts of, uh, sort of differences which people have suddenly started to dwell on. The Tories are exploiting the differences. I think the Labour Party needs to be the ones that brings people together because increasingly we're talking to people as if it's a Twitter profile and we're identifying people as if it's a Twitter profile. Uh, you know, and I would never go up to somebody and say, hi, my name's Peter, you know, I'm, you know, uh, LGBT, you know, uh, so, so, so and so uh, university and, you know, all the things that people are putting on their uh, Twitter profiles to identify themselves. Well, we're sort of taking that principle and bringing it into politics. And I think we need to start really thinking about the whole people, the whole family, the whole person and speaking to those those key characteristics, because I think that's what Labour's done. Uh, that, that is part of our founding principles. And it's certainly what we've very, very successfully done uh, every time we won power. Great, thank, thank you. you so, so much, Peter. And next, I would like to hear from John. Sorry about that. I was just trying to unmute. I had some difficulties there. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, I just want to echo very much what Peter has just said, actually, because the key the key for us as a party has got to be to get out of this tra trap game of binaries, you know, leave, remain, urban, suburban or rural, young versus old, um, those with a degree, those without a degree. So um, that's why I really welcome this progressive Britain idea as a platform for imaginative thinking and uh, intellectual revitalization across the left um so congratulations on setting this up um and it should begin at the beginning i was really taken i think we've all probably read tony blair's um intervention in the new states but as as always it was brilliantly put together a great argument and the notion of refounding labor is absolutely right we might disagree with some of arguments within that but the, the sense of a fundamental overhaul is absolutely right um so you should start with what a party stands for um and what is its public philosophy? Uh, but we shouldn't underestimate how difficult that is because we think we know what the party philosophy is, but um, on closer scrutiny, I doubt that we could fully explain it. I was, um, after the elections this week, I was sent a Snoopy cartoon from a friend of mine where Charlie Brown's got his baseball bat and he's just coming back from a game. And the first one, the first caption says, good grief. The second caption says 184-0. The third caption says, I don't understand it. And the fourth caption says, how can we lose when we're so sincere? And I sort of think that sort of captures something about Labour. We don't, we are, we are very sincere about what we believe in. We don't pay it sufficient scrutiny. Um, and at times we don't seem to understand how we're losing so badly. So what are these timeless values that we hear so much about? And if you go through it, I think you'd probably end up with some general talk about uh, social justice and equality. Um, and if you go through the history of the party, when it's tried to identify its values, it usually is defining what it isn't rather than what it is. So the Hattersley Aims and Values document of 1988 was really a statement about what it was a classic Crosslandite statement about what it wasn't in terms of the hard left of the early 80s. There's Aims and Values document of what, eight, mid eight, it was really a statement against the belief that the party stood exclusively for forms of social ownership and had some loose talk about common endeavor. I wasn't really precise about what the values of the party are. And that's because I think it is a bit of a trap to go down this road. Firstly, these values can be very elusive and very difficult to define. And second, they can become internal battleground. And third, they can tend to segment the electorate and the voters up far too much. Um, we often hear a talk about values modes in the Labour Party, and there's a very popular mode that distinguishes people between settlers motivated by safety, security, and the need to belong, prospectors motivated by success, self-esteem, and the esteem of others, and pioneers motivated by ethics, ideas, exploring and innovating. And the trouble is it chops up the electoral landscape. It divides people very easily. And in reality, people are mixtures of things. They're both you know, liberal and communitarian. They have sort of values that are prone to more settler as well as at times pioneer. I know I am. I'm sort of a mixture, as is every community. And the question is, it creates this static 
way of chopping up the electorate. I think we should pursue a slightly different approach, which would be to focus on um, some transcending sense of huma humanity and what people want and the, sort of the common characteristics of that. I would focus on questions of human dignity and what that means in the modern era. And, and I would try and sort of codify it in terms of new economic and constitutional rights for people. We hear a lot of talk about FDR in the 30s in America and about his massive stimulus and job generation programs. But FDR in the 40s tried to establish new economic and constitutional rights for all Americans, the right to work, the right to security, the right to be housed, right to education, health. And if you add on another one about the right to live in a planet that's not being degraded. Um, I think you could create quite a, very, an interesting framework of new economic and constitutional rights to reconstitute citizenship in the UK. And that would be, I think, possibly a better route to go down than the values game, which can become a very um, tense debate within the party. And it can end up with some very abstract common ground around justice, when the word justice itself is highly controversial in terms of political philosophy. So I would go down a different route, which would tend to talk about um, new economic and social rights in terms of a different approach to citizenship based around human dignity in uh, 2021. Great, thank you so much, John. Uh, and I would like to welcome Stella, our last but definitely not our least speaker. Thanks, Anna, and thanks for unmuting me rather than making me struggle like Pete and, and John. That's what girl power looks like. Um, I think nostalgia is an incredibly powerful drug, especially if you weren't there. And I'm old enough to remember the 1990s and the debates about whether Labour could ever win again and indeed when the West Wing was on the television the first time. So what I want to do today is offer three home truths that I think we need to keep in mind, and then three arguments for how we can match, and I would very much agree with John about thinking more about an operating principle. Um, answering that central question, if you didn't have the late movement, what would you invent it for? So let me offer you three home truths. First of all, I completely agree with John about segmenting because working class people have always voted Tory. That's how Thatcher won, it's how Heath won as well, it's not just Boris. It is short-sighted to treat any group as homogenous or to presume that loyalty to a political party is something you can inherit. Secondly, home truth, we let other people tell us what we care about at our own peril. Now, it might not be fashionable to say this on the common pages, but frankly, there are transgender kids in Hartlepool just as there are white working class boys in Walthamstow. And both groups need us to fight for their liberation, to take them away from the barriers that hold them back in life, because we are at our best when we make the case for that potential to be realised. That it's not about a competition between those groups, but everybody being worthy of our attention because of what they could contribute to our society. And that for most families, what matters is that we care. It's not that they are obsessed with these issues, they're getting on with their lives, but they want to know that we are decent, dignified people who will look after their children and help them achieve. And that brings me to my third home truth, because what really matters is that we fight for whatever it is, whether it's economic, social, cultural, or indeed psychological, that it's authentic, not photoshopped or focus grouped to oblivion. Rebuilding our connection with the British public is to show them what we stand for, why we fight, why it matters, and frankly, that isn't going to be done at the top or by some magic budget policy. So we have to stop asking other people to do the heavy lifting for us, whether it's a leader, a mayor, a trade union, or indeed a policy like electoral reform. Or frankly, if you do look to other people, and I say this is the person who has in my Twitter bio, that standing on the sidelines is for Waldorf and Stabler, stop shooting them down when they stick their heads above a parapet. If you make it impossible for people or policy to be bold, then all you're gonna get is bland. So what can we offer the public as the reason why we exist? The ways that we show that we won't leave anybody behind, that we will seek to get the best out of each of us for the benefit of all of us, because that's to me what socialism is about. It's about liberation, freedom, empowerment. It's not about specific institutions or coalitions or crucially telling people what decisions to make for their lives. 
how can we show the children in Walthamstow, which has double the child poverty of Hartlepool, that we are fighting for all of them? Now, I'm conscious that we've got Pete here. The new Labour government was obsessed with education, and she's right, schools matter. That's why it's fantastic we've got Pete in that job. But in a country where you can inherit a million quid from your parents in property tax-free, it's not enough to have great schools or great universities or even apprenticeships or properly funded early years education. Some children will never have enough assets to be able to achieve what they are capable of, and some families will therefore always live in debt. So let's put a tax on all those PFI companies, the ones who are taking one pound in every four that we put into the NHS out and put it into a child trust fund for all 18 year olds and let them invest in their education or their housing or the business they want to start up or the training course they want to go on. Because we know when we look at those Instagram accounts, they've been thinking about those things since they first got online. Secondly, in a country where nearly as many people are self-employed as work in the public sector, and the average number of careers that anybody in their 20s will have is around seven, two of which haven't yet been invented, it's not enough to expect trade union membership to deal with the job insecurity that is now rife in our country. If you think we can make Brexit work to make up the difference, you need to look at what jobs and what businesses, particularly those small businesses and entrepreneurs who are going out of business are because of the red tape that is coming. So it's time we had a revolution and democratized our welfare state. Learning from the bread fund schemes in other countries in Europe, using the universal basic income system in the areas hit by the collapse of industries, rather than overbearing New Deal programs, and unlocking social enterprise through tax breaks as the way that we get money, people, and creativity to spread throughout our regions. And finally, COVID has shown us just how unequal our country is not just in income, but in gender, ethnicity and disability. You know, if we don't properly fund childcare, when furloughing ends, we are facing a tsunami of mum unemployment. In the last year alone, 500 nurseries have closed, 3,000 child minders have left the industry. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out who is going to be unable to get back to work in the autumn. And when you strip out geography and age, Bangladeshi hospitalities were twice those of white British groups, black African deaths, 3.7 times higher. But it's also those same communities who are least likely to have the savings to be able to cope with the insecure world that we live in now. Only 30% of those communities live in households with enough to cover one month of income. And over a million people are now estimated to have long COVID, facing debilitating symptoms that means they will never be able to return to work. So if we want to liberate people, we have to stop waxing lyrical about the benefits of working from home and put inequality and tackling it at the heart of our economic policy. Frankly, if we'd spent the last 10 years working on closing the gender pay gap and the ethnicity pay gap, instead of trying to make austerity work, we'd have added 6 million jobs to our labor force by now. So I know as things stand, the polls are predicting that we are gonna lose more seats than any we could claw back at the next election. And I get it. That nostalgia is a great jug. A fact factional warfare is comforting because we know how it goes and we know we can find someone to blame for the fact these are tricky, difficult issues that can't immediately be solved with the mantra schools and hospitals. We can find somebody to blame the phone the blame rather than taking responsibility for building those new ideas and that new operating principle that frees people and liberates people. But on behalf of those transgender kids in Walthamstow and those lost boys in Hartlepool, I believe there is another way, a much more exciting way, a way that only we as a labour movement can craft. One where nobody is left behind, where each of us is making the case for change in our communities, not just pontificating about what's going wrong, because so much has for, frankly, so long. Not obsessing about motions to GCs or tired pamphlets, but all hands on deck, because the communities and the networks that will make this country thrive need and depend on nothing less from us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. Thank you all for your brilliant contributions. Uh, I have some questions that I'd like to start off with, not to put you on the spot. And then we've got some brilliant ones coming in from our audience. I don't, uh, I promise now that we've got 250 people in the Zoom, which is amazing. Uh, so as you've all seen my Zoom spotlighting and unmuting skills, I'll be reading them out rather than inviting people to speak. I hope that is okay. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is to come back to something that Pete, that you said um that stuck with me and I actually wrote it down in quotes which is talking to Tories does it make you a Tory um, and I'd like to ask the three of you 
why you think there is a culture in the party that trying to appeal to conservative voters or speaking to conservative voters is a bad thing? And how do you think we might change that? Does anyone want to start? I know it's not an easy question. Uh, I don't mind going, going first. Um, six things, are you still got Stella on mute? Um, and I love the way she got that little uh, jibe in because everybody on the call didn't see Stella struggling to get online before you were all let into the uh, let into the room. But we'll we'll park that for the moment. Uh, look, it's quite it's quite simple because uh, because Labour has been so spectacularly unsuccessful at winning elections. We have spent years and years and years looking at what Tories do, uh, and some of their um, some some of the priorities that the Tories choose when they are in power, uh, focuses uh, success on people who have the most amount of agency to start with. So by creating a tax regime, by creating a school system, uh, by creating a, a, a welfare state, which rewards people who already have agency, it leaves people who have innate vulner vulnerabilities uh, to flounder. Uh, and we have seen that there are some very, very vindictive outcomes from those sorts of policies. So it is, of course, understandable why we would be driven sometimes by a repulsion of some of the outcomes that are uh, that come from Tory uh, policy making when they're in power. However, uh, we have to understand that most people who vote don't do so because they want to deliver bad outcomes to people. Actually, most people are voting because of what's in the interests of themselves, their families, their neighborhoods and their streets and their communities and the broader area. People are very complex in how they vote. But, um, you know, so, so these are the sorts of reasons people are voting for. And those are the people that we have to go and actually sell a positive vision for. And so Labour centrally needs to have a vision of Britain's future, which is optimistic, uh, and it is rooted in, in the reality that people uh, accept. It isn't just this alternative reality, this utopia that we're trying to sell. It is with the grain of what is possible and people, people believe is possible, but is on one side of that. Uh, and, and that is something we need, to, we need to get right categorically and with real clarity centrally. But all of us as activists have a job to play in this. You know, I always say that People on doorsteps forget every word you say within 30 seconds of you leaving their home. But they will always remember if you were nice or not. They will always remember if you were civil or not. And they will always remember if you were respectful or not. And people who are on doorsteps communicating with people, the emotional side of that uh, uh, relationship is incredibly sticky. And for most people, the only experience people will have physically with the Labour Party is that connection you know you a person on your doorstep with a labor sticker on is the only physical experience they all have with us so if we leave one which is sneering dismissive uh giving the impression that they actually are making they they are actually purposefully making people vulnerable and suffer then of course that's the worst platform ever to ask people to go and vote for us uh, and yet we do it routinely so we have to do something centrally and then right down to all of us on this call, we've got to leave people with a really positive impression of Labour because uh, that, that's, our, that's our place within it. So I understand why, but we have to get over it and we have to enjoy the learning experience just very, very quickly. In the two, 2015 campaign, I was selected in June 2013. The first eight months of that campaign, we didn't do any of the voter ID that I should have done. We had massive rows of the party. It was an eight month listening exercise. I went into politics to end youth unemployment and give every young person the best chance in life so that they could fulfill their potential without exception. But when we started door knocking and listening to what the, pro the priorities of our community here was, it was very clear they wanted me to sort the trains out. Every person who was going to work, which is 34,000 people every day from this city in Brighton and Hove, they all had a miserable experience. So by the time the election came around, I spoke about three things, which were the priorities we heard on the doorsteps by just simply ans asking people, what's going on in your life? For eight months, that's what we did. And by the time the election came around, uh, I knew the, uh, the uh, timetable for the trains off by heart for the three stations that leave the constituency. And I knew the, roll the year that every piece of rolling stock was built 
so that they knew without exception that their candidate and their MP, if they chose him, would be somebody who would put the values and principles of his party to task on their priorities, their priorities. And I think that's the sort of thing that we did here to defeat the, the Tories in 2015. And it's the sort of thing that we have to do nationwide. Politics isn't really as complicated as people sometimes make out. Uh, sometimes we overcomplicate the business of politics. But we have values and principles. The public have their priorities. If we want to serve them, let's put their priorities uh, to the top of our uh, agenda and make sure that our values and principles are credibly put to task uh, to solve them and to, to recognise them. Thanks so much, Pete. Um, would either of you like to add anything on that? Yes, Stella. Thanks, Anna. And I'm just disappointed that uh, the people on this call weren't able to see the filter that Pete was using before we joined up. It was the one with the, the little black glasses. So I, he, he looked fantastic, just saying, people. Um, I think it, I, Pete raises a very important, simple question. And I say this as somebody who regularly goes and lobbies. Uh, well, not anymore now. He's, he, he's the leader of the House because he won't talk to me. But, but I used to go and lobby jo Jacob Rees-Mogg quite a bit on stuff. And I'm currently working with David Davis on a, a joint campaign around the Queen's speech. Um, I think there is a intellectual lack of self-confidence if you feel that you can't go and talk to somebody who represents a different political perspective for fear of when they might convince you either that you are wrong or that um, they have better ideas. I think one of the things that's really powerful for me is the sense that you can be incredibly ideological. I know why I'm a socialist. I know why I'm not in the Conservative Party. I don't believe that markets will ever deliver as exciting and imaginative creative solutions as people can to the challenges that we face in our society. That puts me firmly on the left in terms of my belief in the power of people. But I've always found it helpful to go and argue things out with people in different political parties and see whether we can find common ground. A, because the nature of our democratic process is that that's how you win campaigns, whether it's in parliament or in the wider community. And B, because if you are right, then they help reinforce for you that you're on the right track. And actually they've got a point where you should be listening then you help get your policy better. And I say this to somebody who, when I first started working on payday lending, thought we should cap interest rates. And it was talking to people in different political parties about why they would oppose that, that helped get us to a cap on the total cost of credit, which was a much better policy because the arguments they were coming up with were helpful in terms of that stress testing process. So I think you can be ideological, but I think one of the challenges for Labour is if we become tribal. We need to know what we stand for, but be willing to go and argue and talk to people about it, to hear their ideas and what Pete's talking about. I mean, look, we're, I'm making fun of Pete today, but I think one of the best examples I know of a, an MP who has shown that ability, not just to listen, but to lead, but also to be creative and imaginative is Pete's piano. Because if you go through um, Brighton Station, there is a piano there. And actually now if you go to lots of stations, people play. I, I don't play chopsticks, but there are people who can play pianos. And... Pete fought to have that piano because it was something for people who were spending all of their lives going in and out the stations, having to sit on trains that were delayed, really frustrated, made it something special. And that's taking that imagination, that creativity that you get from talking to people and listening to people outside of your comfort zone um, that I think is really important. It's why I think we have to change the way in which we campaign. And I say this every single time and I feel like I'm Martin Luther banging the dial on um i think contact creator takes us our worst rather than our best in terms of having those conversations because it tells us that what matters is to find out when how somebody was going to vote at a certain point in time not what really matters to them and how strongly they feel about an issue so as pete's explained himself had he not put that to one side and gone and said look just tell me what's going on and worked out what people were really exercised about he wouldn't have been able to craft what was a very successful campaign um, I remember in the last election listening to somebody proudly telling me how they'd had somebody on the doorstep telling them they were going to vote green, but they'd, they'd talked about it with them at great length and persuaded them that we were the better party for them. And I just thought, no, that person's told you, yes, fine, to get you off the doorstep. Because actually, <laughs> we didn't respect where they were coming from. We didn't respect the fact that turning up and asking for information for us rather than connecting with them where they were was how we might win them over. Um, the other thing I would say is I think it's a really powerful statement of intent if and when we go out there into the country. So I hope by working cross party on issues, we don't dilute our values, we strengthen people's sense that we will fight for them no matter what the situation is that we face. And frankly, facing an 80 seat majority in the Commons, I don't want to say to people, 
wait another couple of years till we get a Labour government before anything changes. I want them to know that we have been so committed to those values, so committed to liberating and getting the best out of every single kid in this country, that making sure that nobody is left behind, that we fought continuously, whether we were in office or out of it. But we want to seek office because we know we can do even more than we can do when we're out of office to do those things. So I'm one of those people who feels very strongly that we shouldn't make it just about, we'll wait until there's a Labour government. Absolutely, we desperately want a Labour government. This country has never more needed a Labour government to believe in it. But we can start that conversation now with the British public about the changes we've made and whether we could win those arguments now and showing them how we're doing that to show that we are really committed, to show that authenticity. And I think sometimes, to say, it's more comfortable for us to collapse into what we know. Well, let's find somebody to blame. Let's find a reason why we couldn't do it rather than showing that we are prepared to put the effort in and put all hands on deck to make it happen now. Great, thank you so much, Stella. John, do you have anything to add? Great, and the other question I wanted to ask based on what the three of you said is I think you all mentioned, Stella, uh, I think you put it really well when you were talking about the transgender child in Hartlepool and the, work, the white working class boy in Walthamstow. Um, it's clear from me and I personally am really involved in lots of anti-racist work and it's clear that as the Conservative government moves on that it can appeal to the base, the so-called red wall seats, but actually minority rights are the things that get cut. And what I'd really like to hear from you is kind of how you think as a party we can organise around a set of values when we know that the places we have to win back are actually leaning into this sort of culture war narrative more broadly. And I know, John, you had some thoughts on that, and Pete too. I wonder if one of you like to, to start us off on that. Sorry, I'm not finding my way around this technology very well. Um, Look, it goes to the um, it goes to the basic question of where we're going to operate within these sort of political traps that we inhabit, um, which are just dividing up the country, pivoting sort of economics versus culture, or remain leave, or uh, urban suburban, uh, whether you have an education or not. And the Conservatives have been very successful about it. I saw some polling just this week; they're twenty six, twenty seven points ahead amongst working class voters, C2DE across the whole country. And we're uh, doing better across ABC ones. And I think the danger in the Labour Party, and I hear this quite a bit, is that we should double down and play on a, the different side of the pitch because the Conservatives are developing this working class conservatism and they're doing very well in this red wall. I mean, I think the red wall exists everywhere. It's not just in 40 seats in the Midlands and the North. These are fundamental questions about class realignment that are occurring across the length and breadth of the country. They're even occurring in London, dare I say it, which is seen as some sort of gated community that is not immune from some of these realignments. So I think what's happening in the Conservative Party is commensurate with what happened in 79 in terms of rebuilding a different class coalition, which locked us out of power for 18 years. And unless we try and dissect and analyze this, and really learn from what they're doing. I think they can trap us out for a longer than 18 years if we're not if we're not lucky. And that means we have to create some sort of framework that transcends this either or which side of the pitch you're playing on, because they want us to play on the other side that they're playing on, because there is no majority for us if we double down on a remain urban vote alongside university towns. We have to create some sort of framework that moves us beyond that. And then we have to tap into some sort of human um, uh, virtue base that allows us to align the Hartlepools and the Hampsteads or whatever you want. And now I think you can do it. If you move into questions of human dignity as your organizing principle for a new politics, and then you can build a policy framework around that, built around new economic and social rights for all citizens, regardless of where they are, um, including the right to work, right to be housed, et cetera, et cetera. Now, now, you can do that, but it requires a certain political agility that we haven't shown too recently. And it means that we have to go some very difficult places and very difficult conversations. Um, and simply saying that we're not going to talk to conservatives or we are, you know, 
um, we're the good guys and um, we're confident about what we believe in. We need a, a fundamental intellectual overhaul and we haven't got that much time to do it. And um, it can be done, but we have to show the political will to to do it. We've lost four elections in 11 years. Um, the next one's going to be very difficult. I agree with Salah and Pete that there is an agenda there if we have that uh, agility to go and find it and be bold enough to embrace it. Um, but the danger is we're doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and we're sort of trapped in the middle of these this big reconfiguration of politics that's occurring around us. And we don't seem to be participating in the debate. I mean, the worst thing I saw in Hartlepool wasn't the anger, it was the indifference. And that's a sort of deadly characteristic um, that we need to shed pretty quickly. It's there for us if we have the will to go to these places and do them very quickly because um, the clock's ticking. Um, so we better put some jump leads on a conversation about our essential purpose and then build a framework out of that. Great, thank you so much, John. Pete? Thanks. I couldn't agree more. I think the way John ended that, uh, that that piece there was was incredibly prescient. We when you look at, when you go to, to to areas where there are high levels of people who are non university educated, uh, very stable communities, very often white. Uh, you are going very in Hartlepool. There was a lot of new build housing. You know, a, a huge amount of housing was built in the last twenty years, detached. Uh, and it was very, very common when you did get to speak to somebody, it was a very busy household and it would be a nice house on a very new uh, street. Uh, and there would often be, you know, Mercedes in the driveway uh, as, as well as, as a van, uh, you know, because, you know, modern life, life in the 2020s, you can have a mortgage, but you can have one of these, uh, you know, high, high rental purchase schemes through the car. So households are quite, are quite heavily indebted but you're enjoying things that you haven't done before. It's a very modern, very comfortable, very uh, sort of driven lifestyle. Uh, and there are families bustling away behind there, uh, behind the front door. But look at how the Labour Party talks about this. Just look at our party political broadcasts. Every time we talk about the working classes, you know, we're, we're talking about them as if, we, as if they're waiting for a handout. Uh, it, we, we so often mix deprivation and working class. You know, feel, think what it must look, feel like to be at the receiving end of those sorts of mixed messages. Uh, and our life that we present to the world through our party political broadcast, and I've got to say this, we are at our worst during a leadership election. Whenever we have a leadership election, every single public message looks like a Hovis advert. You know, it's got to be with, you know, a brass band going in the background and somebody walking pensively down a street, uh, you know, sort of talking about showing a world which is so backward looking. Now, you know, there is a place for connecting us to our past. Uh, but don't forget, when you were in the past, you were thinking about the future. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, so, so we've got to get this right. We've got to realise that people who are uh, you know, non-university educated, very often working with their hands, will also employ three, four, five, a dozen people, yet they will muck in with their hands at the same time. The, the uh, life and economic life uh, between the classes is bleeding and it's, it's merging and it's, it's intersecting in very new and exciting ways, new and exciting for them, but it's confusing for us who just wants to compartmentalize people and then put it in a spreadsheet and do policies for different types of people and hope that it adds up to a vision. You know, that's too often what we've become since really 2010. So we've got to get back to this thing, figuring out what are the, the, the key drivers of human aspiration and talking to those big essential things. Uh, and then when it comes to other issues, which the Tories want to live in, those little corners that the Tories want to live in, which are divisive areas, which they know full well actually provoke an emotional, cultural response, the cultural provoca provocations that they throw out all the time. Well, we just have to uh, trust the public because people who care about uh, equality know that a Labour government always delivers equality. But in order to deliver it, they've got to trust us you know, they've got to, the voters in those areas have got to have a bit more faith in this big, beautiful beast, which is the Labour Party, uh, and trust us to, to speak to the majority in a really convincing, you know, wide ranging, expansive way, and be as excited about those people who are, who, who are in those 
broad themes as we are about people who have very specific challenges, which we uh, sometimes speak to, you know, disproportionately publicly. Great, thank you so much, Pete. Is there anything you want to add, Stella? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it is absolutely a truism that we talk about at these conferences, but I'm never sure people really connect to you, that Labour at its most inspiring is when it's most focused on building a future for people, which isn't necessarily an easy future, which does involve change, but also is about why as a country we've always risen to the challenge. So if you think about the 1945 manifesto, um, thinking about um, Wilson and the white heat of technology, um, I mean, as I say, I'm old enough to remember that in 1997, our, um, our, our manifesto made a grand claim that we would make sure that every school was connected to the information superhighway. And that seemed terribly new and exciting at that point as well. I think the challenge that we face is that we're talking about communities across the country um, where change is something, you know, every generation has dealt with change, big differences in their lives, big scientific developments, big economic changes, but we're seeing it within our lifetimes. Um, I always like to think about the fact that Facebook is now quoted in a third of all divorces in this country, but we only got into Facebook in 2007, which is actually not that long ago. But if you think about the fact it's now a piece of technology that has fundamentally changed that most basic and most personal relationship, you can see that people are seeing change. Now in that environment, you have two choices. You can either be the people saying, right, well, we'll find you somebody to blame for that change and we'll divide people on the basis that there are going to be winners and losers and if you stick with us, we'll make sure that you're a winner or you build something bigger, you build something more exciting. And I think the left has always been at its strongest when it's tried to build something more exciting and inclusive. Um, I am going to challenge Pete and John just in terms of, I think we, sh I, as I said, I think we should put equality at the heart of our economic policy. I'm tired of things like childcare being seen as a women's issue, because I did biology and I'm pretty sure there are two people at least involved in making a child, if not more involved in raising one. Um, I'm tired of things like the gender pay gap being seen as something that you can jettison when um, the COVID crisis hits, because it's not important, when actually, as I've said, had we been focusing on that, our economy would be in a stronger position. We know around the world, countries that are more economically diverse are more resilient. They've been better able to face issues like this. And as we've seen, COVID has exposed just how fragile the British economy was. Um, I speak as somebody who was told that campaigning on abortion was an identity issue and we turned it into a human rights issue and I'm sure if any of you have seen the Three Families programme and indeed saw the Gogglebox response to the Three Families programme you will realise that actually what the public want to know is that we are authentic and passionate about the things that we care about and if we care about diversity because we recognise it's in everybody's benefit to take away the barriers that exist to realising potential, then we shouldn't be frightened to talk about those barriers, but we should talk about why it matters to all of us. I think we do have to recognise the barriers that exist in our society are not just economic. They are social, they are cultural, they are regional, and that we each have a vested interest in saying, why is it that people are not achieving what they are capable of? Why is it that my community has the 10th, who is in the top 10 for child poverty in the country, and that we've seen the decline of the industries in some of the northern seats that we haven't then addressed because both are going to hold us back. Both are the reason why we are one of the least productive economies in the G7. So I think that question of liberating people from the barriers that hold them back is a thing that joins us together. Because frankly, most people don't think about all these things in their day-to-day -day life. But when it comes to their family, they do think about what's their kid going to be able to do in life. And if we're not the party speaking to every single family and recognising whether your child has a mental health problem or a poor school or the jobs in the local community have gone, they need somebody to speak for them, then we're not the party of Labour. Great, thank you so much. Pete? Just, just very briefly, I, I agree with everything that... Um, that's been said and I, and I think um, what, I want, what I want to follow up from what Stella just said is that too often on the progressive side we're sold we're sold as being too vanilla too uh, unradical because we're scared of being radical actually I disagree you know I you know I, I think I would encapsulate uh, my response to what Stella's and the style and the brilliant challenge that, that Stella's just put out there by saying that you know unlike Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson who wanted to smash up the establishment I want to break open the establishment. That's what my mission in politics, and I believe what Labour's uh, mission in politics is, is to break open the establishment. And too often we've got we've we've got in there and just got a little thing and got some people through, 
But what we haven't done is been assertive enough. And now we live in an age where actually uh, people are more, much more willing to accept a more muscular interventions uh, when it's on the right side of uh, delivering for people, people who need it the most, then I think there is scope for us to be more overtly radical in how we break open the establishment. I've got loads of thoughts on this that I'm trying to get out there at the moment. But, you know, on things like the agenda pay gap, on things like getting people from uh, lower socioeconomic uh, groups uh, you know, into, up into the senior jobs, you know, this, this isn't going to happen by accident anymore. We know now after 13 years of uh, Labour government, we created the people with the right skills, but they still didn't make it to the top. Um, uh, there, is, there is still bias in the system. And I've got to say this, the private sector is getting a damn sight better than other sectors about, about rectifying this. And they're finding ways of dealing with it that others aren't. Not all, not all, the way, not all across the board, but there's been really positive motion. And they're doing it despite government policy, not with government policy and as a result of government policy. Theresa May was defeated within weeks of coming out with, a, with, a, with her ambition to try and tackle these things about workers on boards and so forth. So I think there is a huge opportunity for us, but let's be clear, we wanna break open the establishment we don't want to just smash it up like Dominic Cummings does and then just see who emerges in the rubble because we know full well who survives in times of trouble. Great, thanks, Pete. I know we're running a bit behind, but there is one question that I'm going to use my prerogative to ask. We heard from Anna Sawa earlier this morning, and I think he was excellent at outlining the kind of emotional connection that people in Scotland have to Scottish Labour and the kind of route forward. And obviously we've seen Mark Drakeford um, frame the Labour Party as the party of Wales really effectively. So what I'd like to hear from you, if you have any thoughts on it, is how we can frame the Labour Party as a party of England and why do you think that's failed? John, I believe uh, Labour Party is a party of England. Sure, well, it should be, but it... Um... It doesn't give the appearance often of wanting to be. Um, I was always taken by an Australian politician called Paul Keating, who was very much associated with nation building on the left, about reimagining the purpose and the uh, character of a country going forward. And that was not just about the physical uh, infrastructure, but it was about uh, cultural renewal and literally relocating Australia with outside of a a Commonwealth history and back into sort of Southeast Asia. And he did it with real creativity and showed that the left, this should be a natural terrain for us, as Tony Blair did so brilliantly um, from 97 or from the mid 90s. Um, but you've got to want to do that. And we seem to run away from this stuff all the time. And we don't seem to be um, even interested in trying to sort of reimagine a nation, be it England. Um, and until we sort of even show interest in wanting to do that, um, and that's not just about sitting with a flag behind you, even though a flag is important. It's about, um, as Peter was talking about, a story of hope and optimism, ambition about what a country could be compared to what it is. Um, and that should be natural, fertile territory for a progressive left politics. And you see that sort of, Anwar's talking about a sort of a softer nationalism of hope, opportunity and renewal and sort of cultural reformation. You've seen that in Wales. Um, it's a sort of natural fit for Labour in Wales. Why isn't that in England? Um, and unless we answer that question, we won't win again in it because people can see that we're not prepared to contest the character of the country and talk about it in those sort of terms. And um, so therefore they think we are unwilling to do that. And so therefore, why should they support us if we're not going to have an optimistic story about national renewal? So why that isn't a natural story for Labour, I find quite bewildering, but it still is in terms of England. And unless we change it quickly, um, we will get gamed out within the politics of England and we'll deserve to, because we don't look like we're trying to contest the trajectory and shape of the country. Thank you, John. Pete. Thanks. I, I think the challenge that we have over love of country, love of Britain uh, and the issue with the flag is simply for us to think very personally as individuals about what it is we love about our country and find an authentic way of talking about it. The problem is when somebody, when, when, when another group, another party defines what love of country is and looks like and how it should be exhibited and then forces it on you 
of course you're going to look uncomfortable with it. Uh, and when we are forced to stand in front of flags uh, because, you know, an, another because another party is attached to symbolism to it and is forcing it on you, it looks inauthentic. We look uncomfortable, you know, and when you look at Labour parties of the past, whether it's Wilson's uh, you know, white heat of technology, you know, Blair's Cool Britannia, you know, they found a way of, of, of purposing the future, of uh, uh, describing the future that we wanted to take, the, the destination we wanted to take Britain to. Um, and that by definition was patriotic because we, 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 we put forward a positive uh, vision of Britain and then the way that we were going to achieve it. And then we found a way of bringing in some social iconography into it to represent it and it was completely authentic you know and people saw that it was authentic for us at the time Atlee didn't have the problem because of course you know he had served in the military himself and he was a deputy prime minister through the second world war so you know i don't think anybody challenged his love of country but we live in the 2020s now not the 1940s and we have to figure out as individuals and collectively as a party what it is about Britain today that we really love, you know, and for me that, in, that does include our institutions from the, from, uh, from the military and our defence through to the judiciary, through to the BBC and the, the media, uh, you know, all and the civil service, you know, wrapped up. Uh, and then we have to think about use of the private sector, the charitable sector, about comedy and culture. You know, we have to figure out where these things come together in a, in a coherent story um, and and sell it and believe it and talk about it in, in a way that actually is authentic. Uh, and, you know, I've had this conversation with our local party down here because of course a lot of people are saying that they hate the idea they're gonna have to be forced to, uh, to, to fly the flag. And I just say, well, have a good think, just genuinely think, what is it you love about Britain? You know, how do you exhibit that and talk about it authentically? Because that's what people want to know. Voters don't, you know, want us necessarily to uh, just all be, have one way of exhibiting love of country, but they do want us to exhibit a love of country. Uh, so we've got to figure out what that is. Uh, and if it's not going to be the flag, the thing we, we, we do use to signal to the public that we love our country has got to be really compelling, compelling enough that they don't think about the flag. Uh, but also at certain times, the flag will be important, uh, but we have to figure out how we bring that in at a time that's natural to us that we can all really feel comfortable with. Um, but authenticity is, is crucial and finding our own authentic way of celebrating a love of country is also uh, authentic and it can't just be a metropolitan uh, view of the country. Um, but I think we can do it, uh, but it's all wrapped up in our current identity crisis uh, as, a, as a party. Great, thank you so much, Pete. Stella, do you have anything to add really quickly because I'm being shouted out by the forces that be? Yeah, I said at the start, I thought it was really important that we recognise that photoshopping or focus grouping things to oblivion would be our downfall, at least to blandness. So let me be open with you about where I will be celebrating the flag. I am desperately looking forward to, because I, I think it's a very English tradition, um, being able to boast to all my colleagues when I finally get a gold post box this summer at the Olympics. Um, Latala Mohammed is a local boy from Walthamstow. He got a silver last time round. We had a massive victory parade for him. I've told him I want a gold post box this time round. I call Walthamstow God's own country. We've given you Harry Kane and David Beckham and also Andrex puppies uh, and rubber gloves as well. So we've made your lives better in many sorts of ways because we invented uh, the technology for it. And for me, what rests in that English creativity and that English pride is not always big national statements. It's about how you connect within your local identity. It's the fact that when I call Walthamstow God's own country, I know that my Yorkshire colleagues get irritated. Um, it's the fact that we as a country have a whole Rubicon of language issues, signals, signs that talk to our, our, our definition of place and our definition of purpose that are also about our sense of pride because I'm equally proud of the fact that I work in a community that has taken to its heart a young refugee who is determined to swim in the Olympics and also hopefully will be getting us a gold post box. He may swim for the refugee team, but he's part of our community here in Walthamstow. Um, collective pleasure in each other's success is a quintessentially British tradition. And the person I learned that from the most, and I think the person we should all reflect on, because it's four years since we lost her, was Dame Tessa Jowell. And Tessa Jowell, 
lived and breathed the Olympics because she knew it was so much more about than just the economic investment that would come from it. It was about the cultural renewal. It was about that sense of pride and that sense of inclusivity that actually we would also be cheering for other Olympians from other countries because we were proud to be British and proud to see hard work and proud to have it in our country. So sometimes I think it's important to think about how we tell the stories in our own local areas. As I say, if Latalo doesn't win, we will, of course, let him come back, but we really do want that gold post box. But we will also just be so proud to see people competing in the Olympics again behind our flag because we're British. Great. Thank you so much. Ellen. That was a great note to end on. Can I remind everyone that the sessions from one to two are Wales, uh, rethinking our past, the session on Ireland, and there is a session on England, a case for place as well. Thank you all so much for coming. And I hope this will be the first conversation in a series of many that we'll hopefully have very quickly. Thank you all so much.